Welcome to the Two-Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one big book, read it, talk about it. Really big? Talk about it really bigly? A lot? <laughs> <laughs> for, for approximately one hour every week. <laughs> well, it'll be shorter. It is, this is the last episode. There's really not a lot to talk about anymore. So Yeah, we don't, I mean, who cares? I mean, we, yeah. we kind of... Over. So we're doing this this week's episode, the finale, in two parts. Um, Brian and I are going to talk now for like a short period, and then uh, Nick Sullivan, the reader of the audiobook version, will talk to me later, and we'll add that on to the the audio podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, there's two different videos. If you're listening, you're just going to get two different sections. Totally fine. So the book that we're talking about, like you should probably know already, is William Gaddis's JR, which we finished. We did it. We did it, man. <laughs> so now that so now that you've finished the most difficult book in the world, according to Jonathan Franzen, uh, how do you feel, Brian? Fine. It's, it's a book. Cool. Uh, <laughs> honestly, um, I'm not going to read it or talk about it for probably five or ten years, would be my guess. And then I'll randomly probably pick it up again. Probably around the same time I'll pick up Ada or Arda again. And just be fascinated at the second reading or the third reading of it. I think it's one of those ones I'll come back to and just, it'll be another like in like intensely pleasurable experience to, to read it as a different person. I, yeah, absolutely. I highly recommend to anyone who is considering reading it or wants to reread it. Sorry, cats in the way. Um, the audiobook is amazing. Like okay. it's so funny to listen to and it's like you can just listen to it in like bits and it's got all the voices and it feels like you're watching a tv show it's like it's wonderful so it's like another another different approach it's like what i i've always meant to the next time i read ulysses i want to listen to the audiobook of ulysses okay. um I, I think um for me like the odd thing is uh, i'm work, working on a like in the middle of a novel right now and the stuff i'm reading usually doesn't influence or affect me too much Mm -hmm. um, but this one did like a lot. Yeah. Um, it got, I mean, I, I enjoy dialogue. It's something I like doing a lot. Um, it's something I like to work at, um, and get the sound right. And I, I feel like it can do so much heavy lifting. Um, and I don't know this, this one with how extreme it was in its dialogue and its use of voice to, to carry the, the plot and the narrative forward it really affected my writing. I like noticed my, my characters are speaking a lot more or there's a lot of one-sided conversations that I normally wouldn't be comfortable with almost like the, on the verge of monologue that I'm really uncomfortable with that I've been being willing to explore way more in this first draft. Um, and so, yeah, this, this book really got hooks in me as a writer um, more so than like most of the stuff I read is like, I'll never do that. I don't even want to try that. Not yeah. thing. Uh, this really tapped into something and, and like loosed something in me that, uh, it's really exciting. I was really, it came to me just at the right moment. So it, it was great. Really that's, liked the experience. That's the way, that's the best way that books could work is like arrive at the right moment. Yeah. And, and impact you. That's cool. I really liked, I love this book. I think it's super fun. I think the ending, like let's talk about the ending a bit and then that LARB thing, but the ending um, after the long, the limousine ride, <laughs> holy bass, holy. I just, I just really thought we'd go down the limousine, you know, together, you know, Celebratory. Uh, have you read Cosmopolis, Don DeLillo? No, not in a, oh wait, I think I did, but not, I don't remember it. I recall it's a really, sh it's a short, super short work. Um, so it's Franzen approved. You could probably do it in a sitting or two, easy enough. Okay. But it's, a, you know, the super crazy wealthy person, one percenter doing a limo ride. It's like this crazy limo ride, right? Like that, right. that limo at the end. I wonder if it's at all in conversation with, with, with with Gaddis. I don't know. But I don't know either. I remember when that came out. I don't remember if I read or not. I just know that premise and I can't remember any details. I, mean, I consider them contemporaries, so I could. Yeah, I mean in a way they are. Yeah. Gaddis just died a lot before <laughs> before producing such a thing as as this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Which, I mind you, is this big and cost me twenty-two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that's printing that looks like this. If you're not watching the YouTube video, the font size is, I don't know, 24 point maybe. There's about the, words on a page. They call this Samantha Shrevelin fever dream. Yeah, way worse. 
We'll this make this a novel. Why? We can. I can make that into a novel. <laughs> this is a hundred and sixteen page, like one pair, one one page of written paper. It's drawn That's out. My That's my jam. Lillo's the silence. Uh, yeah, no, I I thought it was really fitting. I know we were just talking to it briefly off air, but I thought it was very fitting that everything ends up in the hospital. <laughs> like this crazy world and how stressful and insane and. The detritus, that's like been the word of the the season, the yeah. detritus and the decay, uh, it will it will lead to all art in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> it is the death of art, right? I love I love the Bast Bast being in the hospital just saying crazy nonsense and like, <laughs> you're not okay, man. Like you need to be on like an in intubator, you need to be intubated, you need to be in like these things, and then finally when he gets better. And like he, that night, so the night that he, he ends up there is they go to see his his aunt's house and it's not there because because it was given up for an auction for one dollar and moved <laughs> down the street <laughs> to the might be by the church. It's so perfect. It's like in the car. Like, he's like <laughs> stuck in the rain and dying of like pneumonia and malnutrition and ends up in the hospital and ends up next to the guy who was the former CEO of the wallpaper company that JR has purchased basically. <laughs> Then he keeps referring to those guys got me out of the wallpaper business. Took them 15 years, got me out of the wallpaper business. <laughs> those guys. Oh, God, it's so good. It's and then so, he just so fucking good. dies up and dies off screen. <laughs> That's the one that dies. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really, like, to think back of the, the work as a whole, um, I really liked, like, the things that I kept kind of honing in on is the, the intersection of um, art and commerce. Mm -hmm. I thought was really, really good, um, as well as the intersection of, like, how, how can any of this even exist, this grift? Like, the only way it exists is through chaotic communication. Yeah. Right? And so I really like that intersection of, of also, like, so there's art and commerce, and then there's the way, like, how commerce is so messed up where no one's talking to each other. And, and that's what makes the book so confusing and challenging, but that's also what makes it work and what makes the crazy plot lines work as well. Yeah. It's, it's this insane miscommunication, like this constant insane miscommunication, the cacophony, the noise, the chaos. Um, yeah. It can only, any of the, all that can only exist in that, if there was any order at all, none, like this would not work. Right, it right. Exactly. Only exists in that chaos. And what does it do to the? What does it do to the artist? What does it do to the human? What does it do to the chill? Oh my God, the children! <laughs> These poor kids. <laughs> they're getting hit by cars. They're <laughs> they're like going to go to. <laughs> the J. Wait, we should we should point out. Jar buys the school. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but those 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 intersections, I thought, are really uh, like work so well and were sustained so well through the through the whole piece. It was just I agree. We're I genius. The thing that's really interesting about the communication um like analysis of it is like there's that that like soap operas do this and lost did this where you never have all the characters know one piece of information. Whereas like sitcoms basically it doesn't matter. Like unless it's a joke within the sitcom, that's not relevant. But like yeah. a soap opera if two people are gonna get married you then have that person go tell every other character that they're getting married so that you can have that person's reaction to it. But it's always the same piece of information and it's told in a way that has no loss. This is like two people, nobody knows what anyone else knows unless they're told, but they can't also communicate with each other at all. Yeah. Like all their communications are fucked up because they're on like, one person's going here, the other person's going here. They're like not crossing paths. So like every time that they try and have a, a moment, it, it doesn't work. And that just leads to this whole breed of things. Yeah, because all, all of the communication, for, I mean, I shouldn't say all, but the majority of the communication is, is, again, another one of those kind of intersections where someone is going to the train station, someone is going to take the cab and go someplace else, and they're crossing paths at different missions and speaking about different things while trying to talk to each other. And thinking the other person knows what they're talking about. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so fucking funny. I mean, like, no, how, how does nobody except for Bass, know that they're talking to a kid. Yeah. <laughs> the JR family of a sore throat. <laughs> the JR conglomerate. <laughs> I, love, I love that like the, that so many parts of this like get invented of like the the I mean this speaks to our time really. Like his like 
biography where they're going to pay him to write a biography of himself or an autobiography of like his success and Gibbs becomes like this weird figure. <laughs> Wait a second. My favorite joke from the end is that Gibbs is like, I have leukemia and they're like, it's all about you. Why are you making it all about you? And there's like, no, he didn't have leukemia. Um, Amy gave him way too much penicillin. And so his white blood count was like way off the charts. They assumed he had leukemia, but he was really just had too much penicillin. <laughs> So it was about him. <laughs> it was about him. And then oh. they, all the business people keep thinking that he's Greenspan. And they're like, this Greenspan character. And they're like, Greenspan's dead. And like, it goes to this whole history of Greenspan. But it's like mixing that history with Gibbs's history into like an amalgam of like an imaginary myth, mythic figure, which yeah. is really like, isn't that the American, like, uh, uh, like the American myth that you can become one of these great, big, notable Self men. Self-made. Self-made. What is it? Horatio Elger. Like the Horatio Elger sort of idea. And like yeah. all the capitalists, like Elon Musk is already like mythologizing himself as we speak. Um, he's like, oh, he's he's on, he's a real life Iron Man. He's, he's a, he is a real life Iron Man. He's got his head really far up his own ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoops. Guess we're not getting any donations of Teslas anytime soon. Yeah. I remain concerned about Grimes' health. Um, I just want to say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's I, I, this ending. I mean, it's wonderful. The way that this ends is wonderful. And like you said, it ends with like a telephone off the hook and JR just saying <laughs> the very last bit. So, I mean, listen, I got this neat idea. Hey, you listening? Hey, you listening? It was like the greatest ending to like a book. Like as, as a famous last line, I feel like that's up there. That's got to be one of the top 10 last lines. Yeah. Ask him, I haven't, uh, I haven't listened to the audio book. How does he perform the last line? Kind of like, like the little spunky kid. Hey, you listening? Hey, hey, you listening? Sounds like Morty from Rick and Morty. Okay. Got it. So kind of that, that sort of, that sort of tenor and that sort of like those beats. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's, it's, it's fantastic. And like beat, this part also has that bit of, um, God, who is it? The Kate's that's in the hospital and is getting all the phones installed <laughs> to get off the line. and then like we have to do the the declaration of that of that of the of the dividend if we miss this dividend then all the things go to amy and they're like he's like i've been trying to tell you that for a long time here and he's like well when's it gonna happen he's like eh, 20 minutes and they're like wheeling him off into the operation room he's like i declare it i declare it he's like nah it doesn't work <laughs> You know, I just realized we forgot to do is the uh, book, the book jacket. Oh, shit, right. or book I, jacket I, I, I'm going to, because I, because we don't have the other podcast going right now, I'm going to take a shit on this podcast on a, on a current book because, oh my God, there, I saw, I, I don't know who this person is and I apologize to her in advance, but this book, the upstairs house this description of the upstairs house is the is the jacket copy that you make fun of, like literally. <laughs> a big book. This is a big book that everyone's writing about, and like a big book right now. Listen to this: Megan Weiler, already detached from her marriage and her life, finds herself even further removed from the reality of those around her when her baby Clara is born. Alone in those early weeks with the newborn, Megan discovers that the ghost of Margaret Weiss Brown, beloved children's author of Goodnight Moon, is living in the attic of Megan's condo, as invited in her tempestuous ghostly lover. As Megan grows more attached to the ghost, their presence becomes more threatening to her and to her family, and decades worth of family resentment is unearthed. This twisty literary page turner plays with the conventions of a ghost story, though it is most concerned with the interior landscape of his characters, partly a meditation on the mental and emotional isolation of the new mother, partly a retelling of the true romantic relationship between children's author Margaret Weiss Brown and poetess Michael Strange, it is an unforgettable, unforgettable portrait of a woman isolated by motherhood circumstance and her own mind. Yeah, that is like beat for beat exactly the template. It is. It's exactly yeah. it. This is a major big press book. Also, sounds fucking awful. Like everything about this sounds awful to me. This no, is the idea. Don't judge a book by its back copy. Ju always judge a book by its back copy. <laughs> Come on. It might be fine. Is it? It's a. It, it's, you know, sure it's fun, that description sounds not cool. Yeah. But the um. So you want to talk about the LARB article that came out in was it 2012? Yeah, 2012. 
Um, I just thought it was interesting because it brought up um, a few of the things we've been talking about this whole episode. I, I came about it uh, a couple of nights ago and I thought it was really interesting that uh, this gentleman brings up a lot of the same stuff we've been talking about uh, throughout our 87 weeks. <laughs> Apparently you cover everything if you talk about a book for 87 weeks. We started before the new year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it starts off with talking about donkey. I thought you'd be interested in that. Yeah. What I think was most interesting to me about this article is that this is like eight years ago, essentially, that to almost almost eight years ago to the day that the book came out and then was reissued uh, by New York Review of Books, which really just changed the cover. Like the book was still out there. It wasn't like it was it wasn't out there. So um, and it goes through the whole thing of like how uh, Delke has taken over this book, that Penguin had given it up. And part of that like publishing industry of like the the estate wanted to move it from Penguin to where it would get more attention and more like more more love and more care and more concern is very valid. Like that happens a lot, a lot more than we than we really realize. Um, where big authors are just neglected on on various backlists if they're not selling well enough. They're just once it gets to that point, nobody cares. I mean, it's kind of the problem with um, not to go on a separate rant, but sort of a problem with the age of publishing employees is that it's sort of like with bookstores, you start out as a very young kid um, and work for like next to no money. And then if you don't make it to the top, you're, you leave. So if you don't, there's like a manager who's older and then there's like a bunch of very young people who know, have limited experiences. And in publishing, I think that's the case where a lot of people that go into like editorial and marketing early on in their careers, because that's where they get hired as like an entry level job, that's, uh, they don't know anything. They don't know these books. They don't know like the history of any of the books. They just know what's there in front of them. And so yeah. there's a huge focus on like the new, the cool, the the flashy, the like woke. The, the woke is not the term I mean, but like the you know the the current the current moment of like what's most important, what's most trendy, and yeah. they pay very much close attention to that. But anything prior to like five years ago is like a black hole to like a vast number of people in this industry, and it's very shocking. So like. This book eight years ago, they wrote this article that could that is almost identical to the ones written eight years later, even down to where it's like LARB is having a big read called hashtag like, what was it? Hashtag read Fran read Gaddis or Occupy Gaddis, Occupy Gaddis for the Occupy Wall Street was part of a thing going on close to that. That was the term, right? And uh, it's so interesting that it's just repeating. These cycles just repeat. We, I, the, not to not the. NYRB is awesome. There's nothing to take away from that. But it's funny because I was talking about this the other night that all the Henry Green books that they reissued a couple of years ago, we reissued those as the first thing that I did when I was at Delkey is the same books. Reissued them, had the same stories, the same pitch, the same everything. And then like a certain number of years later, it's the same pitch, the same rediscovery, the same thing. Like, is it a rediscovery if it's constantly cyclical? Maybe not. But um, but there's something there's something interesting to like those repetitions. But I love that aspect of this article the most. Yeah, um, it's just like the weirdness of like how close it is to today. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Or how concerned he was. Uh, the author, um, his first name is Lee. I forget the last name, unfortunately. Um, but I, I believe that the article is called "Too Big to Fail." Mm-hmm. Okay. No, too um, big to succeed. Or too big to succeed. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like that double-edged sword of Gaddis being wanting to be, uh, you know, well-read, but also being difficult, so you won't be well-read. There's kind of all of these, the contract, this, he talks about contract and status a lot in it and that. Um, but it's really? very interesting how, by the end of it, how concerned he was with the state of publishing and uh, the large publishers, and I'm, I'm sure he's mortified with the new news of the... <laughs> <laughs> of, of Penguin getting our random house getting bigger, right? Yeah, there's a quote. I can't think. I, I was going to try and find it right now, but I don't remember who it was who tweeted it. Um, but it was uh, from the COO of Penguin Random House, who's like, the publishing industry has never been healthier. And they're like, and everything that people were worried about when Penguin and Random House merged, like, no, oh, that came true. We love independent bookstores. We don't want there to be anything. You're like, what the fuck crack are you smoking? Like, and where can I, can I buy that on the street? No. Um, it had a great, here's the quote. Here's the quote. Okay. I found it. This is the quote. The industry is healthier than it's ever been. And all those fears raised at the time of the Penguin and Random House merger, none of them ended up materializing, Mr. Malavia said. The key reason why we haven't done the things 
people were afraid of is that it's not in our interest. We want to keep independent bookstores open. We don't want the market more dominated by a single retailer. <laughs> like, no, you want it dominated by a single publisher. <laughs> like, of course. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you, Penguin Random House, Simon Schuster. Yeah. So, so Lee, this is, you know, in, in 2012, that article, Lee Constantino, I apologize for mispronouncing your name, uh, basically kind of ends up and comes full circle when talking about Gaddis, financial institutions, and um, contract versus status. It's a really neat kind of knot that he ties in this article. Um, but uh, if we think the problem with publishing is that it looks very much like Wall Street, if we have a problem with rampant speculation that faddishly follows the market rather than leading uh, with innovation and quality and sustained investment in readers and writers and critics, if we're displeased with the ugly terms of our literary contract, capital C, um, if um, it might be time to imagine what it would mean not only to occupy Wall Street, but also to occupy the big six. There may be no more important literary task today. So we're facing this directly at this moment in time with the Delkey Archive stuff and being able to like revisit Delkey, relaunch it, reinvigorate it, whatever terms you want to use. There is this running, like not problem, there's a running uh, situation that relates to this where Delkey's books were meant to be the opposite of those. They, they break walls, they break things down. They're, they're outside of the main culture that is dominant at this moment in time in particular. So I wrote the thing the other week or like a few days ago on Ishmael Reed. I got a number of responses to people being like, I've just never read him. I own every book, but I've never read one. Now I'm going to read one. Now I'm this, that, you know, I went out and bought these books. I hadn't heard of this. He's, well, a, he's a cocktail hour uh, author, but you have, you have to know him when you go to the cocktail, but have you actually read him? And his books are funny and like vicious right. and satirical yeah. i mean it's really interesting because that that conversation about like especially i mean it's this is fraught to say and dangerous to say but the conversation around black writers over the past like year has not included him in like the public like twitter discourse and that's uh and that's unfortunate because he should be part of that. he is, is like a grandfather of sorts is he lumped into like sci-fi is that why you think I don't think he just gets, I just don't think he gets read. And I think part of that might be a Delkey problem of like not putting the books out there. And mm -hmm. part of it is that he's older. He's of a different generation. His okay. books are offensive in, to extremely. like the people of this generation. Yeah, extremely. It's in the same way like Kathy Acker now with feminism, right? Like she's, I don't know if she gets talked about the same way. Doesn't feel that. like she's talked about at all. Yeah. And I mean, she's very offensive as well. And she, She's a muckrucker and likes to stir it up. And, and so there's, there's a problem. With, I feel like there's a problem with history these days. Like there can't be historical figures that led to this current moment if those historical figures aren't also of the current moment, but they aren't and they never will be given the nature of their writing. Um, but with the Delkey thing too, it's like, how do we convince people? How do we read Because like even this book, JR is extremely, Gaddis is extremely offensive. Yeah. Uh, the the overt racism, anti-Semitism, like just rampant sexism. Like there's yeah. he's got all the isms and they're like, yeah. There's the, the wallpaper guy's joke who he's like, yeah, I got there. My wife's my suing me. She got this Jew lawyer and like, you Cohen, you're a Jew, right? I need my own Jew. The only way you can bet a Jew lawyer is with a Jew lawyer of your own, right? And he's like, I'm not yeah. taking your case. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to help you. Um, yeah, so it's like, it's the overt racism of that time too. It feels less authorial, um, it, especially because it's given in voice, whereas Ishmael Reed's choices are to like offend and provoke and try and like say yeah. like, you're, you're, you're people, like you're like, oh, I'm the right one. I'm in the right, everyone else that doesn't see things the way that I do is like fucked up. And then he'll take you down too as mm -hmm. his, his game, right? So it's like feminism gets taken down. Like, um, Afrofuturism gets taken down. All the things that are like specific, like people are like, this is the right thing. He's like, no, and attacks it. And that's like not acceptable mode. But beyond just him, a lot of the Delkey books are asking the question of like, you need to be a better reader. You need to be a reader who's interested and willing to like do some work on your own, be part of this, instead of just having everything a ghost story about good night fucking moon spoon fed to you. Like that's not but who, that's has, but who has time for that outside of an academic cloister. 
But but they but they did. But there yeah. were. This is the thing. No, I know. I, I was I'm very playing devil's advocate here, but like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? like, I'm also being blinded by this goddamn truck that just pulled in. Um, the my, uh, mom, my mom was in town. She's asked what I'm reading, and like, I the last seven books I read, like I I can't share them with her because she's not going to want to read them, and she's not you know like it's and it's they're they're too difficult or strange to be accessible to a certain readership. But that Good Night Moon one probably sounds kind of cool because she likes Good Night Moon and she likes ghosts. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, I like I like Patrick Swayze. <laughs> Roadhouse. <laughs> Demi Moore, right? Or, or like my 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 father, I, like he wouldn't read a, a single page of any of these books that I'm reading. And okay, so let's put aside like the people even, who are even academic folks don't necessarily read. Oh, I've been meaning to read. Uh, or, 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 or I heard that one's good. Or like, oh yeah, I did recognitions. I haven't hit Jr. yet necessarily. Like, like something like that. Like it's there's. I think that the, I think there's gradations to it though too. There's the people who are never going to have that. They're never going to read these books. They're just not. Like and who's the audience? Still, like who who's the audience for this book? I, but see, I think it could be anyone. I don't. Okay. Think, I don't think that it it's precludes anyone. But I think that our our culture has sort of shied away from. I turned on. I was thinking a lot about this the other night and talking to Will. You're already saying, but you're already saying in a, in a way that, that <laughs> I forget the name of the book, but the Good Night Moon Ghost one is not for everyone, right? I got, I hope that, not. It is for everyone, probably. <laughs> yeah, that one is, has a target market, whereas JR doesn't necessarily? Uh, that one has a marketing machine behind it, where JR doesn't necessarily yeah like just outside of like we'll, we'll call it maybe just literary fiction whatever that means yeah and like the publishing used to have an this was admirable publishing and it was okay to be a little bit elitist about yeah. it to be small status um, an audience yeah what is the audience for this i mean Delkey sold forty thousand copies of this book in the time that they had the the rights to it that is significant in my yeah. mind is the audience for this a hundred thousand readers that's a huge number. That's a huge number. And that's probably how many people have read it um, in its entirety over the past 20 years, I would bet. That's massive to me. But because it's not a million and the scales aren't a million, it, it feels like it's it's being dismissed. It's just not successful. Who's it for? Who would read this? That's too hard. And like, that's the, the problem is like, putting things into that category instead of changing the way that people read. People are lazy, inherently lazy. And I don't fault them for that, but there are, I don't think that we as an industry should follow that trend till it's end. We should be like, no, that's cool. You're lazy. You like these books or whatever. These books are fun and entertaining. Good. Read them. Nobody has a problem with that, but not everything has to be like that. I think I watched my wife do a puzzle um, and it was like a thousand pieces and it was of a of like a sandy beach, and it looked miserable. I tried to like help for five minutes, and I was just out. I couldn't do it. The like, amount of focus, yeah, <laughs> the amount of focus and the time required to get the pieces to line up right, and then the satisfaction you get when it fits. Like I just had no patience. And I couldn't do it. How is that any different than reading this though? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Puzzles, like yeah, I'm there. It's an it's an investment of time. It's gonna it's gonna be a little bit of work. It's not spoon fed to you. It's a little hard. And but once you once you get the corners figured out and the edges going, like it it starts becoming more fun and more fun. And before you know it, you're done and you feel good about the accomplishment. Then you put it up in the attic and don't think about it for a few years and then pull it out again. You know what you said there a second ago, I think is actually the key is the enjoyment as you as you find the pieces that lock together, yeah. the gratification of that is like the gratification of this. The yeah. experience is more meaningful than the fact that everyone's read it. Yeah. The, the experience of the book is more valuable inherently than being able to say, hey, I write about good night moon ghosts too. Um, so I was talking about like what John was up against through Delkey of like, John and everyone who gave their 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 stuff to Delkey. So the Stephen Moores of the world, the Martin Rikers, Jeremy Davies, everyone who like put in Angela Weezers that put in effort into Delkey's world. And the idea was that you could find something that was unique and beautiful and that you could create an audience for it. And that there was there are like-minded people out there who are like, this is the art that I've been waiting for. The Criterion Channel and Delkey Archive are not that dissimilar in, in a certain way. 
um, in, in, in some ways they are, but in certain ways they're not. So I, I was thinking about this a lot, talking about it a little bit. Then I went to, I was like kind of drunk and I went to onto HBO Max to watch a, a show. And this is what was advertised to me immediately was choose between Godzilla versus Kong, Mortal Kombat, or In the Heights, a very cheesy looking like romance movie. <laughs> you want to watch one of these? I was like, that's the fucking problem. <laughs> That's what my whole life is battling against is that there are other choices. It's not just Kong and Mortal Kombat. There's other things and like those deserve air. I can't. The Mortal, hey, the hey, Mortal Kombat Cinematic hey, Universe. Hey, hey. Hey, oh, geez. Oh, holy shit, Bast. Are you listening? <laughs> Anyone listening? <laughs> Oh, uh, right. well, I think that's all I got for the book. They are final thought, final anything. Uh, it's a big giant puzzle, and if you like puzzles, you're gonna love JR. I think my favorite, my favorite line from this week is, Mind if I take some matches, buddy? Oh, that was mine. <laughs> that's funny on the last page. It is, there's like a billion matches every hey, night. Come on, take a thousand. Christ, you need toilet paper too? <laughs> now, wait a <laughs> Okay, so just as a reminder, we'll be back with the next season of being the Virginie Dupont uh, three-part Vernon Subutex, but we're going to take at least a month off because what I am holding in my hands here, the dreamed or is the remembered part by Rodrigo Frazan, which I need to read and edit, and it is this thick. This book will eventually be a TMR book, and right now it is 761 pages long. So That guy's a real asshole, man. I Hello, Mark! Him and his translator. What are they thinking? I, I will say that this book will mark time for me. That by the time I when I finish this book, baseball will have started. Okay. This is the only way I can think of things <laughs> in optimistic terms now. So well, I'm I'm glad you're done being sexist and we can read some literature by women. So thank you. Look at these dead white guys. Virginie Dupont is fire. That book, well, I, never, I have never read her. I'm really looking forward to it. Really Shit. looking forward to it. The first volume, for anyone who's read it, the, the, it's all based around this guy, Vernon Subutex, who owned a record store that goes out of business and was friends with someone who was a big, big, big pop star and who recorded a video of himself explaining things about his career and about people that he was involved when, with. And then he dies, and this video contains something that could like damage people's careers or or whatever, reputation. And Vernon Subutex happens to have it, but he's also like now a homeless, you know, former record store person. Awesome. And it's character study after character study after character study with like various people like just bouncing into each other's lives. It's wonderful. It's so fun. And she's so sharp and such a good writer of like a uh, human of humanity where people are never like fully satisfied. People are always fully flawed. It's really good. So if you haven't bought it, if you haven't read it, buy all three, get all three. We'll do them in like essentially like five weeks a piece. And we'll have the same uh, gas recur for each one of the three volumes. Awesome. Can't wait. So, okay. Thanks man. I'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the second part of the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Learning 3%. I'm Chad Post, and I'm joined by Nick Sullivan, the man of all the voices. How hello, are you hello. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so glad that you responded to my message after I was listening to your, to the to the audiobook and are here today. Because I people had mentioned several times they wanted to hear from you and thought it'd be cool for you to be on the podcast. And I was like, yeah, it would be great, but I don't know how to I don't know how to get in contact with them. And then I was like listening to the audiobook. I was like Googling and like your website came up and there's the contact form. I was like, oh, that's easy. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. I get I get a fair amount of contacts through that form. They're usually either uh readers of my own novels getting in touch with me, uh, listeners of Terry Goodkind books that I did for um, 
a, a the Library of Congress a long time ago, and there's pirated versions around, and people are like, "Hey, do you have Book 12? And I'm like, "I no, those you're not even supposed to have that. How do you have that?" And then the last thing is Gaddis. I get so many Gaddis emails, and it's it's just amazing to me. And I've done plenty of books for big authors across the spectrum, and yet it's Gaddis and pirated. Yeah. Good. <laughs> it's so interesting, yeah. Because I looked through like when I get done listening to it on Audible, it's like here's a list of all the other books that you've read, and there are so many, and they're they're very varied and very. There's actually quite a bit more than that too, because oh, the, wow. there was a time, audiobooks for a while that when you would record, uh, they had short terms, and then they would usually get a new author to a new narrator to re-record. So a lot of things that I've done, there's now newer versions because I've been doing it since reel to reel and tapes. So there's usually cleaner digital things out there now. That makes sense. That makes sense. So how did you get into this? Um, well, my my dad recorded for the blind for free for textbooks. Oh. So I was aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, early on, I listened to audiobooks driving from Tennessee to New York uh, when I would visit family and then go back for acting. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And there was one day I was at an audition and I saw on a little cork board a, uh, would you like to read audiobooks for free for us, for the <laughs> Jewish Royal Institute? I was like, why not? So I, I actually signed up and I said, hey, I'd, I'd like to record for you, figuring I'll get some experience. Then the very next day, I was doing a, a, a New York student film. Uh, a, a friend of mine was supposed to play the role that I ended up playing, and he called me. He's like, I can't do it. Will you do my part? And so I went in at the last second, did this part, and the woman playing my wife came into the room, and she was mad about something. I'm like, what? And then I'm like, I got fired. From what? She's like, talking books. What's that? <laughs> And she said, oh, it's it's this, you know, they, they do recordings for the Library of Congress. I said, do they? Oh, you have the phone number? And uh, <laughs> so during the lunch break, I went with a quarter and put it into the pay phone and I called them. And the first call I made was to the Jewish Braille Institute and said, hey, I'd like to actually come in now and record this book we talked about. They said, sure. And then I called Talking Books and said, I have experience doing audiobooks, knowing I wouldn't go into them till the next week. <laughs> um, That's like so JR. Well, I, I set up to have a whole week of recording Jewish Braille before I was available to come in mm -hmm. for talking books. Uh, and at the time, I also taught uh, voice and speech at Rutgers University. Oh, so I was wow. pretty good with dialects and, and things like that. And, and I used to I speak with a pretty standard American now, but I, I come from Tennessee originally, and basically okay. you talk to all the people around me, and it's kind of like this. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess that's my long-winded explanation of how that all came to be. Um, even I the first commercial job came out of nowhere. Uh, really? It was Yeah, I was giving someone a ride to a theater, and he had the backstage, which is this little newspaper that actors get. And he's like, oh, there's something for audiobooks in there. I was like, what? What is it? And I happened to have a tape cassette of one of my audiobook uh, auditions. And so up in the middle of Connecticut, in this tiny little town where this theater was, I went in and I mailed a tape back to New York and got it. That's uh, it's what, just what, lots what? of luck. But yeah, it, that, I didn't. Luck plus talent, but luck is always luck is always a great factor. What did, what book was the first one? The the first commercial one. The uh, well, actually, the the first one that I got paid for, which was the Library of Congress, because it was actually a union gig, which was great. I got I was like, oh, I can get health insurance. Uh, wow. That was a day no pigs would die, which is sort of like Old Yeller, except it's a, a shaker <laughs> kid on a farm who has to slaughter his pig. Um, <laughs> and then the first commercial book uh, is uh, Bill Pronzini's uh, nameless detective series, uh, Illusions. Oh, interesting. The first book I did for a commercial. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. How do you, when you go to do one of the books, how do you prepare? What is your process? Um, well, my process has sped up a bit. Uh, I, <laughs> I used to 
just painstakingly highlight with different colors every single person. Uh, you know, back when we started, it was all on paper. Yeah, and then yeah. when I went digital, I would still use programs to highlight everything. And then one day it occurred to me, I, I'm my eyeballs are reading so far ahead. The amount of times I'm going to get the wrong voice and then realize and have to go back in, in a 10-hour book is probably like five times. So why am I spending 10 hours marking everything? So I stopped marking everything. Um, but my process is to do a pretty fast read of the book looking for every time a new character comes in. Because mm -hmm. usually good writers will inform you where they're from, how they speak, what they look like early. Right. Right. Although sometimes I've had books where it's 300 pages in and they mention they have a strong Boston accent and you want to punch them. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, someone reading this might like to know they have a Boston accent back on page 10 when they showed up, not 300. Right. Um, but for the most part, I go through and I mark each person. I make notes about uh, where they're from, how they speak, uh, their personality, which might, you know, if someone is a, a hesitant person, they may have a more halting speech. Uh, if uh, someone is extremely precise, they may be very clipped in how they speak. You know, it's just different. And then you also got to then look at what you've done. I call it the voice scape. And yeah. see, oh, what I'm doing for this guy is kind of similar to this guy. And they've got this huge scene together. So then you have to find elements to, to distinguish them. Um, and when I started out, I used to do a little more of what I call Hanna-Barbera overdoing it, you know, where you just swing for the fences with every character. And now nah, all you need is that a person listening to the, to the book if you took all the he says and she says out, like Gaddis, then you effortlessly know who's talking. Yeah. Uh, and that, but beyond that, you don't really need to go crazy with it uh, unless the author tells you to. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if a waiter comes in and you give him a French accent, but there's nothing in the book saying there's a French accent, that's not a good choice. You know? right. <laughs> Just right. uh, and then, of course, you got to look up all the, the pronunciations and that can take a while. Uh, and sometimes you got to talk to the author if it's uh, very archaic stuff and you figure it's their bailiwick, you would say, how do you say this? A lot of times they don't know. They're like, I don't know. I've only seen it on the page. <laughs> um, but once you have the voices and you have the pronunciations, you start. That's amazing. There, I, I think it was re, uh, not reconnaissance. There's a reconnoiter. Reconnoiter was a word I never heard spoken aloud until I heard it in an audiobook. And it was like, yep. oh, interesting. In order to reconnoiter or reconnoiter. Um, <laughs> <Yep. laughs> yeah, sometimes there'll be a word that has two, and I'll tell the author which one do you want. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. I do a lot of uh, um, uh, my own, one of my book series is action adventure series set in the Caribbean. I tend to say Caribbean. Other people yeah. are Caribbean. And so I always make sure when I'm doing a book where uh, the Caribbean or Caribbean is involved, I let the author choose. That makes sense. That's really cool. That's that, that's the best way to do it. So I know that there's the article in the Guardian that covers a lot of uh, of, of of your of your work with uh, Gaddis and with JR. So this might be covering some of the same ground. But for people listening, how did when did you do the JR recording and what was what was it like? Did had you been were you familiar with Gaddis before you started? No, I I had seen it. No, my dad was just a phenomenal bibliophile. I mean, I I remember. Anthony uh, uh, fantasy books, but then he also would have Proust and all the Greek philosophers, and and uh, he had Gaddis up on uh, a shelf because I remember our house was a library, and I had seen them, but I I, I never took them down, I never looked at them, uh, and I didn't know anything about them uh, uh, when Audible came to me and said. Uh, the estate is looking for someone to narrate these as audio. Would you be interested? And the first thing I saw was how long they were. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, when do you need these? And they said, well, these have been out for a long time. So kind of whenever. And I said, all right. Um, but we had to audition for the, uh, 
for the estate, the literary estate. So um, they gave me the opening of JR with the little old ladies and uh, the, the lawyer and I started reading it and, and that was the first I learned, wait, there's no attributions here. There's nothing explained. So I stopped the audition and went and looked it up and I was like, oh my God, what am I getting into? But I remembered that I thought that scene was really well written. So I, knowing what I need, I went back in and realized I have to figure out every single line ahead of time. Uh, yeah. Back came the highlighting. And uh, uh, I just, I thought it was fantastic. And I really didn't have to work all that hard. Once you picked the voice that the person was in, Gaddis writes his dialogue so much like people talk, it, it was easy. Um, and I got lucky and, and ended up doing it. And it was 30, I think JR was about 37 hours and Recognitions was about 45 hours. And I don't remember if I did them in 2010 or 2011. Let me turn off my phone. So it would have been right around um, the time the Delkey ones were reissued. The what? Oh, the re? No, it was well before the reissue, I think. Before the um, so there was like the Penguin version, and then Delkey Archive Press did one in 2012. So it'd have been maybe around that. Period. It was before 2012 because okay. Neglected Books got in touch with me. And, and they were like, this is amazing. And that was 2011. So th this had to have been before that. Um, yeah, that all tracks because they were trying to move the books at that point in time. And the state was very involved in like reinventing. The, oh, I don't know if I you actually know. had to edit those books myself. I just remembered. Oh, really? I hired someone to do the listen because uh, there's no one worse than hearing if you made a mistake than the person who spoke the words. Because you'll just see what you think you said. Uh, so I got someone else to do it, but then I did all the editing and everything back then. Um, wow. Did you listen to it? Was there music on it? Uh, I listened to of JR. I listened to the last like six hours. Oh, okay. um, did it end? I, with music? Yeah, it ends with like it trails out with music going yeah, see, over. Back then I had to mix the music too. <laughs> they stopped doing oh, really. That. Yeah, because that was a, that was a question that Brian had for you was how the last because the last bit is JR talking through the phone. And like, and, and where that's like, does it like the way that that came through is like, it's clear that nobody's there. And it's like, Hey, anyone listening? Oh, hey, no, it's yeah, so, listening? such a moving ending. The, the, um, the article in the guardian, mm -hmm. when you see it, it says with, with the little banner up top, I cried when it was all over, said the actor. And, and it made it sound like I was crying because this had just been this, draining feet and I was done. No, I what I told him is that ending when this poor kid who has no father figures is just talking into the ether and the phone is swinging, you know, bosses. I, I just burst into tears because it's so moving. Well, but yeah, the, way that, the way that article looks like, it sounds like, oh, I'm so drained. No, it's just, it's it's a fantastic ending and so, so powerful. It's, so, so did you end up? You ended up really liking the books. Oh my God! Yes, yes. I mean, I, I I'll be honest. I preferred Jr. to the recognitions. I think oh. if you're, if you have scholarly, uh, a scholarly bent, the recognitions is probably phenomenal. Um, but yeah. I, I had just, I had to look up so much. I'm like, what is this reference to, to try to get you know why people were saying certain things. Um, but it didn't, it, it, it wasn't the audio uh, uh, audio narrator exercise that JR is. Oh, I got um, I can't even imagine. The, um, when, uh, I have so many questions. The, with JR, like the fact that the, I mean, it really does, it is a performance. The whole thing reads like a performance too. And whereas the recognitions is clearly a book, this one is clearly more voice driven. And I found so many times that when we started the podcast um, of going through the book is like when we read things out loud, it would suddenly click into places of like where the pauses were supposed to be because there's a lack of the, a lack of commas. There's like the, the, yeah, the, all the punctuation is like haphazard at best. Um, I forgot what that question was with that. But then my other question was, do you have inspirations for the voices that you determined? I, like, how did you come up with the different, because everyone's so clear. They're so 
crystal clear that when they start yeah. talking, that's who that is. Yeah, I, I really, I, I think he gave them to me. Um, you know, the Jr. himself, he's got a lot of it. No, see, but you know, so he's got it, and you hear this kid in your head. By the way, Gaddis has written it. Yeah, where he kind of knows the point he wants to make, but he's a kid and he hasn't really de developed the vocabulary yet. So he, he has to sort of work through things. And so that puts him in a certain place. Uh, uh, Gibbs just, I, <laughs> the man is exhausted with life. That's all you really got to have in your head when you're doing that guy. He's just, ah. Oh. Gibbs uh, really, like, your, your voice for Gibbs changed up slightly my reading of Gibbs. Like I always said, Gibbs is like a slightly more heroic in a way, or like, or like going through, it, or like a fighter. And the way that, that that he does seem so exhausted, and hearing it in that way, is like, God, you're right. He's just like the entropy has won. It is like beaten him down. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you make a good point. I mean, I, I could I could see you doing it that way. It's just that when you get to the end of the book, the the problem with. Uh, picking a voice and then having the character evolve in such a way so that, that the voice changes is you end up with an audiobook experience where you're, the character doesn't sound like the character. That, so mm -hmm. you kind of got to pick one thing and go with it unless the author tells you that it changes. Um, right. So I, I, he seemed to be at his wits end far more often than when he was, waving a torch uh so I, I went with that uh always uh, principal, i remember the principal was pretty easy to do because of he he there were all these um, <laughs> um, 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 yeah, he said yeah. I, I remember the first time i read it was when uh i mean south park's been around forever but i was watching a lot of south park and i was like oh this is like the guy on there <laughs> this is like this is like the, the teacher on south park with the the big head that's so always like um yeah um um but, but yeah, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, that guy, <laughs> that guy. But what yeah. struck me listening to it now was that uh, Jr. sounds to me a little bit like Morty from Rick and Morty. Oh, I love that show. <laughs> uh, it's like it was a great show. Yeah, like, like, yeah. I, I don't think I pitched him up right? quite that. I, I mean, the, Morty, the the actor on that, he he does that great, you know, voice break of a kid that's just he hasn't really. They haven't dropped yet. So, <laughs> you know, there's that warble. That's uh, true. Yeah. That bit there? But, it, but I, I, maybe it's not, maybe it's not the voice per se, but it is like the Gaddis voice, the words and the, and you, the way that you read them has that kind of Morty vibe to it of like, Hey man, come on, man, let's just go do this. We can do anything. Yeah. Come on. Holy, holy bass. Let's go down the, let's go down the, let's go down the, in the limousine. Um, the other one that really stuck to me was uh, Rhoda. Rhoda came to life in a whole new way. Hearing your voice. Or, oh my God. You're going to have to, you're going to have to remind me who Rhoda, Rhoda is. Um, the woman who is dating Shram, who kills himself, who's in the apartment, the 96th Street apartment in the bath constantly, and she's always high. And uh, and and I had always read her like she's sort of quasi noble too, but like all these guys are like always trying to come on to her, and she's like you know whatever. But then when I heard your voice, it sort of reminded me of like Janice from the Muppets, and suddenly I had this vision of this woman <laughs> who's being there, be like, hey man, come on man, just leave me alone, man. <laughs> I just want to. I just want to do this, man. Wait well, for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the fact that she clearly was enjoying substances was was uh, <laughs> sort of that was sufficient for me. I'm like, there's your personality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll separate you from the other women, and that, and that uh, I love that teacher who's um, trying so hard to, <laughs> to keep things together. She was great. I can't remember her name. The Amy Joubert. Yes, yes, yeah. Amy slash Emily, yeah. She's she's great, and that 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 her voice is great too. And like her character is one of my favorites for like exactly what you say. Like she's trying to make things work. It's always just exasperated. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much tiredness in this whole book. Um, when you record audiobooks, how? What is, is and there's a the funny bit that's in JR of where Bass is supposed to make the symphony. And the movie director's like, well, you have to record the whole thing for me. And he's like, dude, that's like 90, you know, 90 pieces. It's going to take forever. And they're like, well, how long does it take? He's like, like for every 20 minutes is like an hour of recording time. 
And so it'll be like X number of time. What is that? Is there a ratio like that for you for recording yeah, audio? Well, a lot, a lot of actors. I mean, they always, when, when you're, you've got someone new to the profession and they're wondering that, you know, you, you want to be at two to one or better. Okay. Um, uh, so every hour in the chair, you need 30 minutes of audio. Um, okay. If I've got something uh, that I'm familiar, like if I'm doing an action adventure series for someone and I know the characters already uh, and there's everything's been looked up, I'll be, probably do 45 minutes uh, uh, to uh, will uh, occur after an hour of work. Nice. Um, JR was not, JR and actually recognitions was harder because um, oh, I had to stop a lot. But JR, because I had marked it all out, uh, I mean, the prep time for that was enormous. It took me weeks to get that ready. But once it was all there, uh, I would every once in a while have to stop and go back because of the punctuation where I'd be like, oh, mm -hmm. I I heard that wrong. It's actually this way. Um, yeah. And I, I think I only got a line misattributed maybe two or three times and went back for that. Um, oh, wow. But JR was probably two to one. Nice. Uh, uh, but I've been doing this a long time. Uh, yeah, yeah. And recognitions was probably uh, an hour would produce uh, maybe 20 minutes. Because <laughs> wow. I had to keep looking stuff up and be like, wait, are we? And, and the thing with that was, I remember, is it ecclesi ecclesiastical Latin or wow. is it classic Latin? Because there are religious things and, there, and some of it, some of the Latin has to be one way and some of it has to be another. And oh. Jesus. Do you speak other languages? Uh, no, I mean, je parle français un petit peu. Okay. Uh, mais I always remember this phrase. Uh, mais je ne comprends pas uh, quand on parle trop vite, which is, but I don't understand it if one speaks too quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I speak a little, a little French. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, and passable that's... Spanish, like I know how to pronounce Spanish, and I know how to pronounce German. Mm -hmm. Um mainly because of early books where I didn't and I thought I did and had the books come back and <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> if it's like EU, that. like Freud, it's oi, not Freud. Right, exactly, or Proust. <laughs> yes. very, common, very common mispronunciation. Did you have a favorite section of JR that you liked, to, that you liked the best? Um. I really liked Gibbs. That was my favorite. With his gal and the kid. Um, oh. And the, uh, oh, it's it's this marvelous thing where he they were playing a board game or something, and the kid thought someone peeked and cheated, and so when the cops come, the kid thinks it's because mm -hmm. someone cheated at the board game and. But it, it kind of, you see a bit of Gibbs, the way he might have been if he hadn't been this obsessive personality, where he gets to interact with his kid and there's a little bit of fatherly behavior in there. Yeah. But he just yeah. can't, can't quite sustain it. I, I thought that was a really good scene. I remember that. That's funny. The, I love the field trip. The field trip was fantastic. <sighs> The field trip's so good. Even like the part where they invent the game of like divorce or life. They invent the game of life, but then don't don't remember it the next day. <laughs> like, right. like right. oh, you can move things around. Like, oh, pay mortgage, pay this, pay lawyer bills. Now the wife has to go to the psychiatrist. Now the wife has to do this, like pay this thing. And they're like, it would be a great board game. I was like, that, that literally, that's a board game. Like yeah. literally is a board game. <laughs> like you're right. You would make a million dollars off of that, but they're too drunk to remember the next day. <laughs> Going on. Yeah, no, the, and the apartment spitballing with Gibbs and who, who's the friend who? Eigen. What's that? Eigen. Eigen. Yes. In fact, I think I, I I got to pick a sample for Audible. I think they ended up using one I hadn't even picked, but one of the samples I provided that I thought was good was uh, Gibbs telling Eigen about his condition. Um, <laughs> I thought that Why do you have to make it all about you. Why do you have to make it all about you? <laughs> yeah, when he's, I know. I'm not I got you. Let me have this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> always, so fucking good. That was one of the parts that I was like listening to of the audiobook and literally just crying with laughter. Cause it was like, this is too perfect. Like reading it is very funny, but hearing this come to life, it's so much more three dimensional. <laughs> it's so much more of a performance. 
Do you think there could be like a play version of this, like a dramatized version? Oh, I, I don't think so. No, I mean, uh, well, I could see it. It could be done as a movie, right? As a series? Well, yeah, I mean, to do it properly, it probably need to be like a four, uh, like four hour miniseries or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, there are many aspects of it that are universal and that you go, oh my God, that's this today. But there is an awful lot in it that is of a time that I don't, I don't necessarily know if it would translate as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask. It's, we've t it's come up a few times over the course of this. We talked to a playwright uh, during the series um, to talk about like writing dialogue and writing writing in that way and like approaching it. And and he talked about it too. Is like one of the problems that that we came up with is that the book is hard to create one protagonist. So like the the single story, the sort of like way that you would tell like a normal movie or a play or whatever, like there's so many different foci that it's like hard to like conceive of like how that might work. But at the same time, like it's it's like built for the stage. Like it is built for people to inhabit these characters in so many ways. And the way that, and I think actually what I, I think the way that I want to come around to this is that it seems like that, but I think the audiobook is that. I think your audio performance is the best version of that. Because all, everyone comes to life in their way. You feel their their human condition. You feel the situation that they're in very well. It's like all gets conveyed and you don't need the visuals. You don't need HBO. You needed like the different voices and the the, the cadence of that. Um, I think it's really, I mean, I really, I can't praise you enough. I think it's like the most marvelous audiobook I've ever heard. Like by far, by far. Well, um, how do you feel with like, uh, how are audiobooks... Uh, like right now it feels like from the publisher side, um, as a publisher, there's been a lot of emphasis on audiobooks and on audiobook like growth because people have smartphones, they're able to like listen to things easily. Audible now is like, you know, gigantic and it capable of like making things seamless and very easy. And it feels like a lot more people are into audiobooks than there were 20, 25 years ago. Um, how, what's that been for your experience or from your perspective? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the amount of audiobook work um, uh, for me is, uh, I have to turn things down just from wow. schedule. It's just, uh, th there are so many uh, books being created. Um, and, and because I'm now, uh, writing and performing my own books, uh, and I have a fifth, wait, I had one that's off by itself and then I have four. So five, um, I, it's offered me a different perspective because I can look at what I'm making from the Kindle and the paperback and I can look at the audio. Um, and I would say for every uh, $2 I make in uh, paperback and Kindle, I make about 75 cents in audio, which yeah. is an appreciable amount though. It's, 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 uh, you know, there's a lot of expense in creating an audiobook, so a lot of authors um, won't do it unless it's uh, uh, through someone else who pays mm -hmm. for all that, and then they end up not seeing much in the way of royalties. Um, but the, yeah. the sales are pretty good. Um, that's what, that's uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a burgeoning industry. People are on the go, and it's it's a way you can be doing something else while you're... I listen to audiobooks when I'm working on uh, landscaping and stuff, you know, we're working out. Oh, the, 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 this is going to tie into the earlier part of the podcast that you're not on, but listen to audiobooks while you do a puzzle is kind of perfect. Like, uh, doing the, you have like, yeah, something where you don't, the, the, there's like a singular focus. Yeah. I guess you could. Yeah. Like you're doing it. You're doing another thing. You don't, I don't think when I'm doing a puzzle, I'm just like, trying to figure out what's there without like it's like a uh, lizard brain part but like the other part can be listening to an audiobook and mm -hmm. enjoying um that be that yeah, covid yeah. covid fucked up everything for like all of our like i used to listen to like an audiobook a week because i'd be you know riding my bike to work and now i'm like oh i listen for seven minutes when i wake up before i get ready for work <laughs> like, get ready for work in my bedroom where i am right now <laughs> 
I've been I've been listening to um, uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower series. Oh, and it it's so enormous. And I am I'm on the last book, and I've been on the last book for two years because oh. I just I don't. And by the time I remember, oh, I've got that. CD in the disc, and then I'm I'm like I don't know where I am on the CD, and uh, you know because I it's one of those. So uh, my habits. I mean, I used to listen to an audiobook every time I visited family uh, on the drive. Yeah. Yep. And now not so much. Um, but I, I find I listen to it more just sort of out and about. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, yeah. I love it. It's 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 a it's added a lot of like. Uh, interesting parts to like my reading life um, by the way of like books I might not have time to like read because of work being like naturally like having to read books for publishing and editing and reviewing and all that stuff and they'd be like oh I really want to read this book for fun and it's like you know time for that and then like being able to listen to it was like ah yes I get to read it and I get to experience it in this different way it's usually like books that are more like a uh, ton of French books or John Banville mysteries or like things that are like in, in, in that way that I'm like, I really want to read this, but I really don't know that I can justify it without feeling like, oh shit, like that poor author is waiting for his edits. And I'm like, oh no, sorry, man. I'm reading about dead people in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. I mean, it's really cool because of the rise in like the popularity of podcasts and audiobooks seem to have gone hand in hand in a lot of ways through this digital world. And I, I think it's fantastic. It's like a whole new audience. We had, um, we're a very small publisher, but we got two of our books got bought by, uh, Rick, is it recorded books? Is that right? Oh well, yeah, um, no, recorded books is one oh, of sorry. Tantor Media. Tantor, Tantor Media. Well, Tantor and, and recorded books are, are now owned by the same company. Oh, the same um, company. We get our checks from one, but it was Tantor specifically. Yeah, that yeah. Two of them, and we're like, this is amazing. Like now we have a new audience for like all of, for these books that otherwise are like these you know experimental translations that fit into one category and certain people read them, but now they're available mm -hmm. very universally. And uh, it's been Tantor very- Tantor actually has the rights to, uh, and I recorded for Tantor, uh, Carpenter's Gothic, yes. uh, Rush for Second Place, and Agape Agape. Oh. Uh, I was supposed to do Frolic of His Own, but uh, just timing and uh, some of the requirements, I just couldn't do it. But apparently it hasn't been done yet, and now I'm getting people asking me to do frolic. So um, maybe at some point I uh, I checked with the literary uh, estate, who I, I'm now talking with, and apparently Sarah Gaddis, uh, mm -hmm. his daughter, has listened to the books and loves them. So we're hoping to do frolic at some point. Um, uh, I'm a little. I think T Tantor didn't have the worldwide rights. Uh, I'm not sure. People in the UK can't get Carpenter's Gothic, which is strange to me. Um, so that probably has to do with uh, worldwide yeah. versus US. I, I don't understand all that. Worldwide, worldwide, worldwide. Yeah, this can be this can be a non, uh, this, uh, this is an insider joke for everyone, but I know that it's the agent that's, that's taking, that's causing that problem. And that agent is the Wiley agency. So they're, that, I think that they yeah, are the ones. Well, they're the ones I was talking to about well, no, actually, I asked them, I said, what's the situation on it? And they said, well, we see here that it's with uh, uh, Tantor, but we're not sure why it hasn't been done. And I'm like, I think that's because of me. I'm sorry. Uh, so they said they were going to look into it. Uh, um, good, good, good. I've had a lot of people ask because it's the only one left. So um, Yeah. Uh, I just read it for the first time this year as preparation for JR. Um, it, and it, it's really hard <laughs> in terms of prep. If you think oh. about how you're going to approach that, I, 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 that's why I had to turn it down at the time. I, like right now, I have uh, my own book coming out, mm -hmm. and eight other books to record for other people on top of that, between now and July. So oh. if they were to say, "Can you do frolic now?" I'd have to say no again. Uh, uh, but this time, I'm going to say, if I can have my own time with this, I promise yeah. you, I'll get it to you. I promise, because I want to find the zone get it all prepped ahead of time. And then when I know I have time to do that and nothing else, then I can do it. I, it, it would be really good to have the audiobook of that available because, and this might be an old man, a concern. I don't think it's sitting in here anymore, but I can read the paperback. The font's too small. <laughs> I, had to, I had to buy the ebook 
and and expand it so I could pay attention because I was like, I cannot. This is hurting my eyes. This is giving me a headache. Well, trying to know, I'm going to I'm going to tell them. Uh, <laughs> That's that's the fun thing with these podcasts, right? Hey, Tantor, if you're watching this, one of the requirements they gave me is that I had to read from the paperback. And I have my dad's paperback. And I was like, are you kidding me? Unreadable. I can't. I No, I would be in front of the mic with it. it it's impossible. So I said, can you scan no. it? They're like, it's not in the budget. Um, so um, in retrospect, I wish I'd just said, sure, and then bought the Moby and read the Kindle of it because it's, it's going to be the same. It's, it's a classic. I mean, Audible but, and Amazon are connected, so. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but again, I think it had to do with the rights, with the, uh, I, I think the, the, for whatever reason that you can't get Carpenter's Gothic in the UK, that that's tied into why I had to read it a certain way. So uh, I just knew I wouldn't, I would be having to stop constantly from paper noise. And I, I was trying to figure out how, and I, I even sent a picture of the holding. I was like, this is why I can't do it. <laughs> it I, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I, I felt so weird telling people that, but I was like, I can only read like 20 pages of this. Cause it like, it's so small and the paper is so white. You should tell Sarah Gaddis that she should uh, make Simon and Schuster give up the rights to that and sell it back to the new Delkey archive. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> sure. I would well, totally reprint that book now that I'm in back in charge of the editorial stuff for Delkey. So we would, we would do that in a second. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a thought. Um, yeah. I, you know, I've got my dad's, I should have brought it in here. I have my dad's copies back in the living room. Uh, uh, and it, it's great, uh, but it's, it's, it's a beast. Uh, it if you enjoyed JR, though, you uh, Carpenter's Gothic, I call it JR Jr., yep. which I think is rather clever. Uh, and and it, it it's, has a lot of the same satisfying aspects to it that, that JR does, but it's about seven and a half hours instead of 37. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think there's only maybe many characters, not, not very many characters. Right. That was the first Gaddis I read was Carpenter's Gothic. And I was like, this is amazing. And then I found out that JR was like the expanded version of that. So I went the opposite way, but, but it was like, yeah, this is this. I love this. I love the books that, that work in this way and that function like that. Um, and Frolic of His Own does tie in a lot to JR because the, the, the play that's written by whomever in JR, uh, can't think of his name now. But he worked for the foundation at the beginning, and he's a playwright later on. It's like I play did about not realize War. that. Oh wow! Yeah, he writes a play about the Civil War called Red in the or whatever it is, Red and Blue in the White, whatever. Like the same title. Yeah, 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 yeah. That thing, America in the Red, White, and Blue, or whatever. Well, and he has a lot of tie-ins. I mean, there's stuff about player pianos in his books yes. because he he was fascinated with player pianos and their history, and. Uh, I loved recording Agape Agape, which is this tiny little one-off of his, Beast. which is sort of Gaddis bitter about never having done that project as he's dying. And uh, it, it reminded me of the way I did Gibbs. I was like, uh, you know, this, this is someone just railing at the sky. So when I recorded that, I cleared my schedule and I recorded it nonstop with no breaks. Whoa. And because I thought, I'm going to start, my voice is going to start going and it's going to, and it'll actually fit. And it was exhausting, but I, I like the way it's interesting. If you, if, if, if you're all, if you, if you got a copy of Gape, try something out. Listen to me in the very beginning and then pull up the last chapter. And, and Holy you'll crap. hear as right now. I have um, a, I have a credit on Audible and I need I need a new book and I read that when it came out when it was like the posthumous uh, moment when it when it was first published whatever that would have been two thousand and four but I don't remember it very well at all but it got me a gape is referenced by as Gibbs's book in Jr too yes yeah it all yeah it all ties right. together but yeah I was I I forgot like how much reading Frolic of Zona, I was like man so much of this is familiar but not quite familiar and then rereading Jr for the first time in fifteen years I was like that's it. That's why is that this stuff is in there. Like it's, it's, he's just reworking well, yeah. it in a new way and a new sort of litigation. And instead it of seems heresy it. to, to make any comparisons to Stephen <laughs> King with, with Gaddis, but 
if you if you read enough Stephen King, you'll he can't stop himself from doing little callbacks here and there to all his books. Yeah. And Gaddis is full of that. So full, yeah, absolutely. Makes it very, very fun. Very fun. Um, so I have a, I have a, I have a final question for you, and I can let you go. Uh, is essentially plug your books. Tell me, tell us about tell us about the the four book series that you have and what you're working on right now. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so back here, wait, there we go. Oh yeah. This, this uh, is the deep series. And over here is the sequel to Zombie Bigfoot. <laughs> and I'll, I'll plug Zombie Bigfoot first. Um, <laughs> Zombie Bigfoot is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's, okay. it's a horror comedy. Um, I actually hate the zombie genre, <laughs> but uh, I love things like uh, Shaun of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And I love action adventure kind of things like Crichton books. So Zombie yeah. Bigfoot is this sort of creature feature uh, horror comedy. It was number one in horror comedy on Amazon for, for a few days when it was. Wow. Uh, um, and uh, I ended up jumping into this other series and I've left it. So I, Aaron asked me about Zombie Bigfoot, even though that's not what I'm known for right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I say it's. It's the screaming idiot child in the basement chained to the radiator that I still love because it's mine, but <laughs> it's just down there. <laughs> um, but I plan on actually wait. Let's see. Do I have? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So here's this is the original oh, cover. But now that it's been out a while, I actually got a guy that designs covers for Stephen King. Oh. And uh, the, the sequel of this uh, is what I'm going to be working on next. Uh, but what I've been doing the past two or three years are these guys. Um, let's see. There we go. There you go. So these are our action adventure. Uh, I'm a scuba diver. And I love action adventure books um and i love doing dialects as, as an actor so uh my idea was i i have this uh odd couple pair uh boone fisher who's a ex tennessee boy tall lanky dive master and this little four foot eleven south london fire plug uh spit and fire girl uh named emery emily D durand and the two of them are dive masters that just get into the worst situations despite their best efforts. Uh, and unlike a lot of thrillers, I don't, you know, I don't have superhuman spec ops guys who like have every single possible talent and unlimited resources. These two schmoes just get by by the skin of their teeth. And I set every book in a, a different island. I found out, you know, I, I'll start a book. First book's in Bonaire, ends up in Seba. Second book's in Seba. A little bit over on Stacia. Third book's in Belize. Two different islands there. Fourth book coming out now is in Cozumel. Wow. Next book in uh, Grand Cayman. Uh, uh, and they've been doing great. And I, I, I deliberately write them with the idea that I'm going to have good audiobooks for them. So I make sure, uh, you know, I, I joke that uh, the Chicago and Boston accents are my kryptonite. So there, you will never have a Chicagoan or a Bostonite in my books. Oh, uh, thank God! Voices. Both those cities. Fuck it's Chicago good. and fuck Boston. Fuck <laughs> Chicago and fuck Boston. So I'm good. I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I, it's it's been what I've been up to, and and uh, when you asked me to come on today, I was finishing uh, Deep Devil, uh, which is the next in the Deep series. Uh, it's Deep Shadow, Deep Cut, Deep Roots, Deep Devil. Um. And uh, something for the listeners might be interesting. Uh, the best proofer you can have as an author is a narrator. Uh, some of the authors I work for will now not go to the formatter with their book until I've read it. Because no matter who they pay to do the proofing, I'm going to find a whole page worth of typos. Or even inconsistencies. I'll, because I've freshly read it, I'll be like, he was in the passenger seat, and now he's in this seat. You know. Yep, yep. Um, so I just finished recording it, and after I hang up with you, I'm going to be plugging in all the changes 
that I made. <laughs> I've got an entire page worth of, of things like, wait, she doesn't know that. Why did she say that? That was the other guy who knows this. And little things right. like that. That makes a lot of sense. So you you plan on having all of them come out simultaneously as close as possible, right? Yes. Uh, oh, um, uh, ACX, which does the books for Audible, is has got a bit of a backlog right now, and they're pretty far behind. So uh, uh, it the audio doesn't always come out with it if you are uh, self published like me. Uh, mm -hmm. I I do self pub. I um, I have plenty of published authors who are phenomenal in terms of their sales. I have plenty of published authors who are not selling as well as some of my self-pub authors. Yep. So the ones who are very successful, I kind of learned some of their tricks and, and it works. But if you're self-pub, it, it means the audio is it's going to come out when it comes out. Oh yeah, that's true. Okay. Okay. That's fair. But it's cool that like you, you use the audio to help uh, edit the, the, the book itself too. The, the, oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And this one's going to be fun because I have some, and it's important to the story, talking on a voice changer. So I've been researching ways to go in and actually modulate that voice to to sound like it's on a, a voice changer. And I, I figured it out. So wow. I'm doing that over the weekend. Do you just take like a, you take a t-shirt and wrap it around a phone and just talk from a, a quarter phone and that's pretty oh, much no, it's, it's a combination well actually if anyone ever listens to the audiobook of zombie bigfoot i did a lot of every time uh, uh silverback who's the the big uh lead baddie bigfoot in that uh every time he was thinking i was like i want this pitched way down and maybe a little reverb and so uh this creature just sounds like you know it's really cool <laughs> It's <laughs> so fun. And you record, you must record everything in your, do you record everything at home? Yes. Okay. Well, um, that's not true. I, I, um, it's, it's steadily become that way. With COVID, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But before COVID, I would say if I did um, 24 books during the year, uh, 18 of them would be in my studio and the rest would be somewhere. Like Audible or Penguin. Penguin has their own studios. Hachette has their own studio. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of people do it at home now. Uh, and now with COVID, the ones that would want you to come into the studio will actually patch in with uh, sound, um, sound something. I can't remember. Um, but they'll actually, they could put a director with you or they can even tap into your microphone and they can run the session. That's amazing. Like that. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. I mean, that 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 seems like the best. Like of the COVID um, restrictions, this seems like one that works out the best. The well, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I I'm extremely fortunate for you know the writing and the audiobooks. books. Uh, uh, I, I work best when I'm not doing anything else anyway. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm an actor in film and television, and and uh, done a fair amount of Broadway. And all of that's gone now. So, uh, you know, the audiobooks is is what I'm depending on that and the uh, and the writing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So buy my books. <laughs> oh, yeah, buy, buy the books. Buy all of them. Buy all five. The uh, is there any um, any book that you that's not one of your books that you've wanted to to do the audiobook for but haven't yet? Oh my gosh, a dream. Well, project. The one that's already been done. No, just, a, I mean, it could be, or it could be, it's never been done. Either way, oh. any book you think would be a book that you'd love, like, love to to, to read and be the, the audiobook producer. Gosh. For. Um, okay, you know what? Um, I mentioned to you earlier that there was a time when things, when they were done on cassette and, and they were, things were like, little four-year contracts and seven-year contracts. And then the rights would come up again and someone else would come in and record it. Uh, early on, I recorded uh, Carl Hyacin's Sick Puppy. Yeah. Hyacin is a funny, funny guy. And he writes these, they're sort of mysteries, they're sort of thrillers. And he has characters that are bonkers. Um, the, 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 they're just marvelous marvelous gifts to a narrator and uh i did sick puppy i got great reviews for it 
Ed Asner did the abridged version and I did the, uh, the full version. Uh, and it was great. And I never did another uh, Hyacin because uh, they, they went off and got someone else. But that is something uh, I, I would love to do those books because the, he just hand feeds you these nutso characters every single book. That um, seems that yeah. seemed, that would be a, you would be a great match for that. Based that, on well, that. And it's just you, you just love going into work when you're doing when you're doing a Hyacin book. They're so funny. I mean, so that would be one. That's amazing. Amazing. Is there anything else you wanted to, to say or question I didn't ask you? I don't think so. This has been cool. Uh, well, I'll, I'll mention that um, uh, some of the Gaddis folks reached out to me about his uh, centenary, centenary, however you say. Are you, uh, um, yeah. And uh, um, I don't yet know that anything's happening with that. It's not till 2022. Um, but uh there is a chance uh, I, i'm suggesting that frolic of his own uh should be done yes. but maybe held off and uh kind of have a little red carpet at this centenary you know, to to put the last book uh not yet done an audio for gaddis out at this uh 100th uh, 100 year celebration of his birthday i believe it is it is. And uh, yeah, so that uh, is going to take place in St. Louis next year. Yeah. Um, and uh, I got an uh, email inviting me to propose a paper for that. So hopefully I will see you there. Well, that we would be cool. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping we're all, you know, vaccinated up by then. And I'm getting vaccinated on Tuesday. So oh, wow. <laughs> I teach in person. The, oh, OK. Yeah. No, yeah. honestly, I, I think I teach all and in. all grocery store workers should be on the list right now. They are. They are here. You're in New York, right? No, I'm in New Jersey. Oh, okay. I, New York. I, I call New York because I am right next to it, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know what your rules are, but in New York, if you have like, if you teach in person, even co and college students, which is what I do, and that's, and they're like a huge vector for this. So it makes yeah. total sense. One of my students is recovering from COVID right now. Um, but then all grocery store workers are, are allowed anyone who works with like, uh, an older adult that they're taking care of all capable of getting vaccinated. It's just like the, you wait and wait. And well, wait. yeah, you gotta, you gotta get it too. As it, yeah. Yeah. So I'm driving to Potsdam. I don't even know where Potsdam is, but I'm going there. I on Tuesday to get vaccinated. That's quite some distance from you. Are you up in Rochester? I am up in Rochester. It's like four hours. I worked at Jiva. No shit. Yes, yes I did. Serious? I did, a, did a, a, in the small theater there. I did. Um, it was an original <laughs> piece. Of it's a small you take that back right now. They'll be very upset. It's a that? giant theater. It's the most important theater in all of Western oh, New York. No, 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 no. I, I worked okay. in the small theater in the Jiva. Oh, oh, no, okay. a black, a black box or something. There's black box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's a huge theater. <laughs> um, uh, Although if you want me to make fun of them, uh, they, they used to keep everyone at, at this um, housing we called Sarajevo. Yes, holy shit. Okay, it's like, you're the what is this terrifying place? Um, the, yeah. This is so funny. I have to tell you this and I'm leaving this on the recording. Okay. Dan O'Brien, the playwright that was on, um, he did a, uh, a play called, um, Shit, what was it called? It was about the Fox sisters um, who are local Rochester created the call, the idea of like uh, mediums and talking to the dead. And they were like very, very prominent in the Rochester area. And he wrote a play about them and they performed it at Jiva. And so he came on this podcast to talk about the book through the playwright's eyes. And after we hung up, after I stopped the broadcast, we just sat and talked for a while. And he's like, yeah, when I came to Jiva, we went to this, we stayed at the place called Sarajevo Towers, which is what we all called it. And then I was like, that's so funny. I was like, where yeah. was it? And he started describing, I was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And to tie this in even further, Jiva then bought apartments for everyone that are right across from where Brian, the co-host of the podcast lives. So from his balcony, we would be able to look into where the Jiva people stay now. And it's beautiful. Like it's- Oh yeah, no, I, I've heard they they- they went the other direction and now they have great housing is what I heard. I was back <laughs> there to do kinky boots. Uh, we were, we were on tour. 
No, the tour for Kinky Boots, uh, the 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 tour. I was there in 2016, I think. Oh my god! Yeah, Ooh. you had a great that, brewery that over there. I I went to a brewery across the river, on the other side from Sarajevo. It was really good. I remember Rock City, yeah. Rock something, Rock. Oh, there's Rock Brewing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Rock Brewing is great. Yeah. Wow, nice plug. Yeah, I, Dude, love you... I thought it was cool. You need to come back up here. Well, there's there's a brewery. I, I, so I live not far from. I mean, it's all small. I'm not far from that. I walk by there. That's where I jog by when I when I jog is go by Rock Brewery. But we have a brewery right next to my house um, called Three Heads. That's really good too. And I would take you on a tour of all of these places. Come Excellent. Up, well, do, do do it. We'll have, have a good time <laughs> next time that we're all able to meet again. Move move about with safety. All exactly. right.